Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Military and Aerospace Electronics webcast. Our topic today is swap-constrained SOSA. What's next for small form factor computing envelopes? I'm Jamie Whitney with Endeavor's Design and Engineering Group. To begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply type your issue into the Ask a Question box, and a member of our team will assist you. You can also click on the question mark help button in the upper right corner of the screen. Additionally, we welcome your questions during today's event. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation. But please feel free to send in questions at any time. To do so, simply type your questions into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. Also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Military and Aerospace Electronics website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. Now, let's meet today's speakers. Mark Littlefield is Director of Systems Products for Elma Electronic. He is an active contributor to multiple VITA and SOSA technical working groups, including the SOSA Small Form Factor Subcommittee, and was co-chair of the VITA 65 Open VPX Working Group. He has more than 25 years of experience in embedded computing, where he has held a range of technical and professional roles supporting defense, medical, and commercial applications. Mark holds BS and MS degrees in control systems engineering from the University of West Florida, where he wrote his thesis on a neural net approach to image processing. John Riley is Senior Technical Marketing Engineer at Samtech. For more than 20 years, he has defined, designed, developed, and tested high-performance copper, RF, and optical interconnect for a number of embedded computing applications. Additionally, he and his wife champion STEM education, advanced manufacturing techniques, and community outreach via their nonprofit Makerspace. John holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Louisville. Now, let me turn things over to our presenters. Mark and John, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. And uh, welcome everyone. I'm glad uh, everyone could, could join us. Uh, I'm Mark Littlefield from Elma Electronic. I'm here with my colleague, John Riley from Samtech. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about um, VNX Plus and its role in SOSA. So uh, just to do a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today, we'll do a quick uh, uh, summary of what SOSA is all about and how VNX Plus plays uh, in, into that. Uh, we'll talk about the the organization of the the uh, uh, of the the beta 90 standards just so everyone kind of knows the lay of the land with regards to the standards uh, and uh, we'll also dive into some of the the technical details of slot profiles and how VNX plus actually works uh, we'll then uh, take a look at how systems uh, could be built using VNX plus uh, and talk about some specific use cases and examples. And we'll wrap up with uh, some uh, roadmap discussion and uh, Q&A. So um, let's start with SOSA. <clears throat> the Sensor Open Systems Architecture is a, uh, a reference architecture uh, that's designed specifically for uh, defense sensor systems, uh, things like e uh, EOIR, EW, radar, SIGINT, and communications. Uh, as a technical standard, it's driven by the SOSA Consortium, which is a group made up of, of government and industry and academia. Um, there's, uh, oh, I, I've lost track of how many member organizations and how many members actually participate, uh, but it's, it's well into the hundreds of, of organizations and over a thousand people uh, participating at one level or another uh, in the standard. Um, the standard is not a, a ground up standard. It's, uh, it's really based on, on other existing standards. It ha leverages Open VPX very heavily and other VITA standards. Uh, and that's where VITA 90 uh, and VNX Plus comes in. So uh, let's, uh, the sensor open systems architecture at the highest level is, you know, pretty pretty motherhood and apple pie goals. Uh, the goals are to be open, uh, that is vendor agnostic and, and MOSA aligned. 
uh, that it's standardized, uh, both hardware, software, and, and mechanical, that it's uh, harmonized with, with other standards, that we're not you know, competing with other standards, if you will. We're adopting and adapting uh, rather than inventing uh, when, when we uh, uh, just when we can, um, that it's aligned with both the objectives of the, the services along with the kind of the course of technology, that it's cost effective, that it, it cost is a big part of SOSA. We want to be able to do system integrations faster uh, because faster uh, gets uh, equipment out to the field and into the hands of the warfighter, uh, um, you know, more rapidly and, and more cost affordably. Uh, and then lastly, it's adaptable. Uh, it changes with as technology changes and as the requirements of the, the services change. So what's driven small form factors is that uh, we've originally uh, started SOSA based around VPX, but there are limits to what VPX can, can serve uh, in, in the marketplace. There's, there's a, a bunch of systems uh, that are very common out there that VPX is just simply too big. We're going to dive more into this slide later, but I did want to introduce this concept that there was a range of, of systems that really couldn't be well serviced with, uh, with OpenVPX. So the Small Form Factor Subcommittee of SOSA was formed in uh, late 2019. It had a charter to explore options for hardware that were, you know, in quotes, physically smaller than 3U VPX, uh, and to draft standards language around that. Uh, our goal was uh, to include a form factor in the technical standard um, that uh, uh, has the same characteristics and flexibility as 3 VPX, but in something that was much more suitable for, for much smaller systems. Uh, in, after uh, some time and doing uh, trade studies and what have you, we decided to choose two options. Uh, one option, the short VPX, was a pretty easy option to pick. Uh, it's the same as, as um, uh, uh, normal 3U VPX, and, but instead of being 160 millimeters deep, it's 100 millimeters deep. Uh, it's captured in Vita 48.2. Uh, and so, like I said, pretty easy to, to, to capture in the standard. And uh, other than its, its shorter length, it has all the same characteristics and the same rule set as, as OpenVPX. Uh, problem is, is that there was still uh, a, a fairly sizable uh, class of systems that, that couldn't be serviced by short VPX. And after doing our trade studies, we found that, that VNX, V74, probably came the closest to, to being suitable for VPX. But what we found was is that there was really some enhancements that were needed to make it really suitable for, for SOSA. Now, just as an example, this is uh, uh, kind of uh, an example of why we needed something even smaller than than short VPX. Uh, you know that, that while while there's certain systems that that short VPX work great uh, works great for, uh, there's others that it was just simply too big. Uh, and we're going to again dive into this slide a little more in detail later. So uh, another challenge was that the small form factor that we picked for SOSA needed to meet all of the SOSA criteria. It couldn't skimp on any of these things. So it had to be modular and replaceable and scalable and, and uh, portable and, and uh, it needed to be able to be secured and, and uh, it needed to be vendor agnostic. All of these, these criteria needed to be met. And what we uh, concluded was that uh, Vita 90, as it came to be called, uh, really meets all of these. Um, so, as I mentioned, <clears throat> there were certain enhancements that we needed to do uh, to Vita 74 uh, before it was really suitable for SOSA. Uh, specifically, number, the big one was, one of the big ones, was that there were no provisions for blind mate optical and coax. So there was really no way to bring in that, that streaming data either from, from RF data using coax or video data using coax uh, or, or optical uh, uh, fiber optic. Um, in addition, while there were PIN assignments, uh, they really didn't align well with what SOSA needed. And so we needed to really kind of refactor the whole PIN assignments of, of Vita 74, uh, both in the utility segment um, as well as there was no slot profiles. And so we needed to have slot profiles. Um, and lastly, uh, the, the, while there were 
deployed systems out there using Vita 74, there wasn't really well defined uh, uh, thermal management uh, approach to VNX plus or VNX rather uh, to Vita 74. And we really needed that for SOSA. So we started working on these changes and what Vita decided was is that what we were doing was so different from Vita 74 that it would be broken off into its own set of documents. And that's where Vita 90 was born and but thus VNX plus. Uh, so with that, John, I'm gonna pass I'm gonna over pass to over you. To all right, appreciate it, Mark. Yeah, and so so VNX uh, VNX plus the evolution of Vita seventy four is is what became known as Vita ninety, um, and as you can see here, uh, each of these dot standards we'll we'll touch on just a little bit as we go through this, um, but these were created to I guess further define and expand on what we we learned was lacking in the prior revision. Um, but also wanted to kind of mimic and, and match uh, some of the things we learned through work in, in OpenVPX. Um, so as you can see, the base standard, Avita 90.0, um, and, and portions of these or are, are pieces of these are what have are been adopted by and rolled up into SOSA. So, so not every single one of these is in, in SOSA and in, in the full capacity, uh, but Vita 90 uh, stands alone as a, as a small form factor. Uh, and then SOSA is ad adopting up pieces that are that are relevant and being agreed upon by the, by the full committee. So, as we uh, as we scroll through these a, a little bit, um, just the, the base standard, right? This is the the, the main document that, that explains uh, how we have enhanced beyond Vita seventy four the small form factor system. Um, it breaks out the the slot profiles, as Mark mentioned, uh, talks about some of the thermals, the optics, the, the coaxial. Um, and so it, it did build on the foundation of the work that had been done and, and work that started on Vita 74. Some of that started almost six, six plus years ago um, as, a, as a smaller piece, uh, as a standalone Vita piece. Uh, and as you can see, uh, as we go through this, I, I do have some of the sponsors listed that are in the, the working group. Uh, if you are ever interested in joining the working groups through Vita, um, there, there's anywhere from 30 to 40 uh, folks that, that follow those working groups and, and can contribute to each one of these DOT standards. So you'll see who the, the I guess, the lead sponsors are as we go through this as well. Uh, and I do encourage if, if you want to learn more, not only with this webinar, but in, in, in the working groups is where you can get into some of the details and, and really understand or, or have your voice heard on, on what you need. Uh, so as we go through uh, 90.1, uh, this really talks about the slot profiles. And I know Mark will touch, touch on some of the details and what's included in some of these. Um, these may look similar to, to uh, similar as in the table style that you may be familiar with, with, with OpenVPX. Um, but there's some uh, enhancements and, and additions in here that, that we'll talk about. Um, so again, the, the slot profile, the backplane protocols and, and AMPs, the, the altern alternative module profile schemes will be touched on in each of the other, uh, the, the DOT standards. The 90.2, this was one of the enhancements that was lacking in the, in the prior revision. Uh, this is that uh, the floating uh, backplane coaxial and optical interconnects. Uh, that, that take anything from uh, size 16 or size 20 RF connectors uh, and cables, both at 50 ohm and at 75 ohm. So that, that was uh, an important note to, to mention is it's not just, not just 50 or not just 75, but includes, includes language for both. Uh, they are the traditional uh, blind mate, uh, kind of rugged backplane functionality there. Uh, and some of those graphs, the insertion loss, return, lo return loss plots that you see, um, take it out to about 60 gigahertz for performance on the RF components. Uh, so again, this is a, it's similar. It's a different form factor uh, than the OpenVPX to fit this smaller envelope. 90.3 is where we, we start talking about the power filtering conversion and, and energy storage. Uh, you know, how, how are you going to power and how much power can these smaller modules take? Uh, so some of this is the, the, the definitions around that. Um, if you notice, uh, and we'll see some of the, the end profiles of the connectors as we, we get a little bit farther along, 
Um, it's all the same interconnect in, inside. It's different, different versions and different flavors of it as we go. Um, but this one, Vita 90.3, is for the power filtering and, and conversion. The Vita 90.4 is about the advanced cooling and retention. So smaller, uh, can you push more power through it? How do you get that to escape? Uh, most of this is through conduction cooling, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit as we go through. How do these get installed into the systems in cases? Um, you know, there are notes there to, to talk about retention mechanisms. Um, how do you interface with the chassis? Are we talking about wedge locks and, and locking it in as a positive system there? Uh, and, and so this portion of the standard is, is really to define and discuss that. And then uh, 90.5, uh, as we were working on smaller form factors, uh, where and how and, and what could be used here, um, a lot of space applications with the CubeSats and the smaller form factors here uh, needed a little bit of definition, a little bit of language around it of how, how can you set this up, if this is going to be a modular architecture for all disciplines, um, to send it into higher altitude and, and, and higher flight. Uh, so not just the CubeSat market, but uh, additional high altitude uh, applications, uh, including some of those other types of uh, in-band protocols, the, the Ethernet, Space Fiber, Space Wire, uh, Serial Rapid IO, and, and of the such there. Uh, but this is, again, a definition on, only around the, the, the Space VNX Plus or the, the Space uh, applications. There is a, a placeholder for 90.6, but 90.7 is is a, in a secondary uh, a RF and uh, optical backplane option. And so this is in discussion. This is uh, the last couple are not uh, fully wrapped up into SOSA, but they're uh, all included in the VITA standard. Um, so there are additional uh, notes and working groups to make sure that we are uh, really uh, reviewing and, and looking at all options for the coaxial and optical uh, additions uh, to, to just the, the copper uh, connectors. So SOSA has focused on the, the, the larger of the two. Uh, there is a, a 19 millimeter height option. There's also a 13 millimeter height option um, in the VITA standard. However, for SOSA, the, they're focusing on the, the plug-in card size of the 19 millimeter. Um, so this will be uh, the Samtech C-Ray product. Uh, this is a, a legacy connector that if you've messed with anything with FMC or FMC Plus since the, the early 2000s or mid 2000s, this is the same contact and solder joint that has been on those platforms and in flight since the, the early uh, 2000s. Um, so the, the C-Ray was a, a very high reliability connector, uh, went through additional ruggedization, additional testing to make sure that it not only fit the size, but fit the applications and use cases. And you'll see these, these different uh, pin counts. Uh, these are the options for the different aperture openings that were, were mentioned in the, the, for the coaxial and optical edition, uh, but anywhere from uh, open pin field of 400 pins uh, down to 240 pins in that 19 millimeter size. And these are where the, the definitions are kind of defined. Uh, the, the VNX, the base standard is, is just that basic uh, 400 pin uh, connector. Um, and then as you add in to the RF and optical, so both for 90.2 and 90.7 will have that same aperture opening um, of the, the C-Ray connector. Um, the power module or the, the power of the 90.3 uses uh, this, the, the half aperture connector just keyed and positioned differently so that you can, again, still use that same interface, that, still, that same contact system. Uh, and, and just uh, use it for that different slot profile. So just a little bit of uh, maybe, maybe comfort of, uh, of how to use the C-Ray connector and why it was selected. 
Um, it is an open pin field, which which means there's not dedicated differential or single ended or power contacts. Um, it's kind of universal. They're used used for all of them. Um, how the profiles are set up or how the tables are set up. Um, this allows you to be very flexible with with what pins are used where when defining the standard. Um, this did go through as, as a, um, a single point of contact, but both mechanically stamped uh, cantilever beam style, uh, hard, hard metal, uh, high plating options for reliability. Um, but we also made sure we wanted to, uh, it's terminated similar to a, a BGA, but it's uh, what we call a solder charge. You see the cross section picture there in the middle, um, it's kind of an eye of a needle with solder embedded through it. So it's not a, 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 a blunt or a, a post just down in a piece of solder. Um, that's how it was qualified to, to meet that class three acceptability criteria through the, through the IPC standards. Um, and so that was, uh, we did work not only with IPC, but with, with other industry partners to help uh, define that. Um, and there is a link to that, that uh, approval and, and definition there um, in the slides. And that can be provided as well if, 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 uh, for comfort. The C-Ray also has been tested uh, beyond what the standard needs electrically. Um, we have uh, d designed and developed this to be as, as flexible as possible. And, and as you can see in that, that bottom uh, right picture, is how you can define the positions and define the, the table of, of what this is used for. Um, but then you can also see the other uh, test uh, protocols that we've, we've checked it against. Not all of these are wrapped up or even mentioned in, in SOSA or VITA, um, but these are, are test reports that are live on our website that, that you can uh, download, take a look at, get the, the models, get the, the signal integrity models, um, and, and verify these, but uh, so it's beyond uh, PCI Gen 3, uh, Gen 4, uh, the, the gig ethernet uh, and, and different protocols, the SAS 4.0. And so all of these the different types of protocols will run through the same same connector. Um, and so that's why it makes it so, so useful for uh, future upgradability uh, modularity and and being able to kind of make some definitions uh, on your own within the, the slot profiles. Uh, so with that, I think I hand it back over to Mark to, to kind of talk about some of these slot profiles. Indeed. Thank you, John. So um, let's go on to the next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, Vita 74 really didn't have any slot profiles. So one of the first things we tackled was, you know, how, how what, what do we need in the way of slot profiles for, for SOSA? Uh, well, at a, in a gross sense, uh, we need payloads uh, with different connector types because different uh, types of payloads have different requirements. Uh, we have switches uh, that, that you need for, for, the data, for the data plane and control plane and, and potentially even expansion plane. Uh, we need radio clocks. Uh, PNT cards or, or radio clock cards are a pretty uh, important feature of, of these types of systems. Uh, and then also we needed uh, some specialized uh, security uh, uh, profiles. Um, and so we kind of took a, a blank sheet approach uh, to this and, and, you know, we said, okay, what, what utility signals do we need? What planes do we need? Uh, and then, you know, what, what, what sort of uh, uh, other kind of connectivity for each of these classes of, of cards? So we actually started kind of with a template. Um, and where we broke it up into three, broke the pin field up into three segments. Uh, the, the S0 utility segment, which is the region in green. The S1 communication segment, which is in orange, and that's where your data plane and your control plane and expansion planes are located. Um, and then um, everything else we grouped together into something called an overlay segment. Um, and that's where we really kind of define specific slot profiles for the most part. Now, not every, every uh, slot profile that we've defined follows this template exactly, um, but the majority do. And it, it does encourage kind of a, a design reuse, if you will. 
And I also note that uh, the 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 the, the, the uh, utility segment is kind of more towards the right uh, uh, right hand columns, where the the the, the communication segment is more towards the left. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, with Vita seventy four and the experience that the industry had with Vita seventy four and the Sam Sam or the the C rate connectors rather, that. Um, the the column the pins in the columns to the left generally had better signal integrity characteristics than the, the the pins in the columns on the right so we took advantage of that and we pushed as much high speed as we could to the left of the, this field and the, the the kind of the lower speed and the power and things that aren't sensitive so much to signal integrity uh, to to the right So let's talk about the three uh, planes for a moment, the three segments for a moment. Uh, the, the first is the, that utility segment. Um, and what you'll find when you to kind of dig, dig into the standard and, and look at the, the pin fields, that uh, first off, it has the same uh, uh, utility segment uh, uh, pins as uh, OpenVPX. Um, the power planes, things like NVMRO, G discrete one, and so on. All of those signals are, are you know, sys reset, the ref clock and aux clock, all of those are common to, to OpenVPX. Um, in addition, it has a dual IPMB, uh, that is the system management bus. Um, very important. I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the, the slide deck. Um, but uh, we also incorporated some other things. So for number one, the maintenance port. Maintenance ports were introduced with, uh, uh, in, in, with SOSA and, and into the slot profiles that SOSA chose in OpenVPX. And we went ahead and incorporated it straight into the, uh, uh, into the utility segment. In addition, there's some uh, things that you maybe didn't expect to see in a, in a utility segment. Uh, there's a gigabit ethernet port, a base T port. Uh, that's basically everything minus the magnetics. We move the magnetics off the module so that uh, it saves a little bit of space in the module. Um, but uh, that and the USB and the serial ports and the GPIOs, whether they're single-ended or differential, uh, we wanted to have those things because most single board computers and a lot of other kinds of, of boards have these ports. And we said, well, we've got the pins. Let's put these ports in a predictable place so that they're always in the same place in, in every slot. And so that, that's why these were introduced. And then lastly, and I've got a slide on this, there's a field called UEIO, which is the uh, unique external IO uh, port. And uh, I'll save talking to the, that uh, when, when I get to that slide. So moving on from, from the utility segment, uh, we've got, the, again, the S1 uh, communication segment. And that, as I said, is where your data plane and control plane and expansion plane live. And then the S2 uh, uh, overlay segment. So this is a little more complex in that, uh, depending on the connector used, it can either be all copper pins, it can be all uh, aperture fill block, or it can be a combination of copper and aperture fill block. Uh, and so that's really where your slot profile specialization uh, takes place is in that region. So I mentioned about UEIO. Um, this is, again, is something unique uh, to VNX Plus. It's not found in OpenVPX. But um, based on experience of doing small form factor systems, it was not uncommon to be wanting to talk to devices using, you might call it, uh, you know, industry standard interfaces like uh, I squared C or SPY. Um, very often you had things like port expanders or maybe not quite so high speed uh, communications channels like CAN bus and things like that, that you might talk to with SPY uh, that, that you would implement on your front panel. And you wouldn't necessarily take, want to take up a slot to, to get that kind of capability. So what we did is we created this port and uh, then defined certain uh, uh, combinations of, of, of connectivity. Uh, this is all captured in Vita 90.0. Uh, it's, it's not captured in the SOSA technical standard yet, but you can be assured this will be captured in one profile, one, one uh, configuration will be captured in the standard. 
So uh, looking again at the slot profiles, some of these are in the standard. Some of them are, are, are waiting for, for uh, standard documents to be released out of review. Um, but you, uh, you can expect to, there, there's no profiles in snapshot one of version 2.0 yet. Um, but there, you can be assured there will be profiles. Uh, in in um, uh, Snapshot 1, though, you will find a 400-pin switch. Uh, there's a 320-pin switch that, that uh, is fewer ports, but it includes the uh, uh, aperture for, for optical connections. Uh, there's actually two radio clocks. Uh, there's one that supports seven radio clocks that's based on the, the payload template. So that's kind of uh, interesting in that you'll you could basically have a product that's an SBC, but that also provides that high performance radio clock for up to seven slots. Um, however, there were systems that required more than seven slots worth of, of uh, clock, and so and that that might be counterintuitive. Uh, you might think, well, this is small form factor. Why would I need so many many ports, so many uh, slots? Well, imagine you're making an instrumentation pod that's just packed full of electronics, but it has to fit in the space of an AIM-9, so a tube uh, shape that's hanging off the wing of a high-speed jet. Um, this would be a perfect example of where you would have lots of slots, but the slots are swap constrained. So VNX Plus is kind of the 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 the, the architecture of choice, if you will. Um, you you won't find it in one in the snapshot one rather the two dot snapshot one, but there will be space VNX Plus profiles and power modules defined. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, uh, we mentioned AMPS earlier, the Alternative Module Profile Scheme. Uh, this was originally developed for uh, OpenVPX. Um, what we were finding in the market was that uh, Vita uh, 65.1, which captured the module profiles, was suffering from basically a combinatorial explosion of all of the different protocols and combinations that, that one might uh, implement for a particular profile. Um, we wanted to avoid that from the beginning. <coughs> Excuse me. So we we went straight to AMPS, and that's how we define what protocols are implemented on what ports. Uh, and again, you'll find this in the technical standard. Um, the format uh, for AMPS for uh, uh, BNX Plus is slightly different than than OpenVPX, but it's the same general idea. There's a, um, a header portion that defines uh, the slot profile and characteristics of the card. Then you've got the protocols for the individual ports and you wrap up with uh, how the aperture fill blocks are, are populated. And with that, <clears throat> I'm gonna pass back over to John. Too far. All right, appreciate it, Mark. And, and so uh, now we're, we're talking about the, the system approaches to where what Mark alluded to of how many modules and how, why would you need so many or, or how could you stack them up? Um, that That's the whole purpose here. That's the whole system approach of, of how you're gonna stack these together, um, whether they're a, a front-loaded kind of cassette uh, into a box or a, or a small uh, a frame um, or if you're going to top load them uh, in, into a uh, into another slot or, or block, um, or to the the tube profile that, that we've mentioned a couple times here, it just seems to be the more uh, demanding constraint uh, form factor system. Um, and, and so, loading these things uh, horizontally in a tube takes a lot more deconstruction to to get to versus uh, if you pop pop a hatch off the top and and change out the, the, the modules uh, in that framework. Um, and so as you as we see some of these other examples, uh, and kind of revisiting that image as you saw earlier, uh, VPX, uh, open VPX, short VPX, they, they can all fit in, in some of these architectures, just not vertically as shown here. Uh, you might be able to get a couple of the cards uh, longitudinally or ho horizontally uh, loaded in there. And, and again, the, the, the repair, the upgradability, and the maintenance of those um, could could cause some problems. Um, where again, this the uh, VNX Plus was designed specifically around that purpose of, of 
a horizontal stack that you could even daisy chain those together and add as many modules as you needed to down the, the, the length of the, of the tube or through the profile. And just as a, another uh, view of that, and so we, this was just kind of a size volume uh, graph of how big or how not big these modules are. Um, so to the far left, uh, the VNX plus the 19 millimeter is, is kind of our baseline for, for just comparison on, on volume. Um, but now a, a short VPX and, and a 0.8 inch pitch um, it is not it's just a little bit over twice as big. But since the one inch slot is is uh, is more more readily used or more more accepted. Um, it starts to expand out and spread out. So just to show what, what volume we're talking about, um, which, which goes into what platforms and, and where and, and why this was created. Uh, so we saw this earlier, but and again, three VPX horizontally, uh, a single card or system could fit in some of these, uh, but just in that backplane architecture with the, the vertical loading um, that's where we start to really see how we can turn these into more off the shelf solutions as opposed to custom solutions in that smaller diameter, that smaller form factor. Um, and if you can change your architecture to do that, uh, that's where you see a significant volume and weight uh, reductions to really talk about that swap, uh, you know, the, the, the benefits of that. Now, doing all these things is not without some cost, right? Uh, you, you won't get the same uh, high power that you might with a 6U card on a, on a three inch pitch, um, but you can get significant uses, uh, significant power in some of these form factors. Uh, traditionally, we see this as conduction cooled uh, we see the layers stacked up, the thermal interface layers that take that to the shell. Uh, and then you're, you're touching off those shells to either the case, uh, to another frame, or to something to get that conduction, that, that cooling out. Uh, the, the standard was kind of written around about that 25 watt module, um, but we knew that was, people are going to demand a lot more from that. Um, and so we have some studies here where we talked about some different frameworks and different uh, materials, um, some small minor tweaks, and you can and you can uh, increase that wattage uh, for each module. Um, and so anything from the initial simulations, initial testing done on aluminum shells, uh, changing those out to copper shells, uh, changing out the type of cooling that you have surrounding it. Um, or the extreme case of uh, this far right column is the oscillating heat pipes is, is kind of still a unique uh, cooling solution. Um, but it's, we've, we've had conversations with people using that method now in systems, uh, not just VNX plus systems, but other systems that are getting more comfortable with that oscillating heat pipe. Um, and then you'll also see where we talk about the wedge locks uh, that goes back to 90.4. Uh, that extra security, the extra rugged and reliability of, of locking those in. Um, so those are some additional things to, to think about as you're implementing these in systems. Um, and so now we'll kind of talk a little bit about chassis management and I'll send that back over to Mark. Okay, and this will be the last topic before uh, we wrap up. So I mentioned earlier that chassis management was a part of uh, the plan for, for both, uh, of, you know, VNX Plus and SOSA. In fact, chassis management is a very important part of the SOSA technical standard. <clears throat> the standard defines kind of two channels, both an in-band and an out-of-band chassis management mechanism. And the out-of-band uh, is based on VITA 46.11. So with, uh, within VNX Plus and, and SOSA, uh, we adopted the exact same uh, approach, the same in-band and out-of-band, with the out-of-band being uh, based on 46.11. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here for the sake of time, but I did want to just stress that uh, it's, uh, you know, it's as important for VNX Plus as it is for, for OpenVPX. 
And as a reminder, we set up two uh, uh, IPMBs, that is the, the, the control buses uh, for that out of band system management. Uh, so while the standards are both in work, both the, the VITA 90 standards documents um, and uh, uh, the, the SOSA technical standard, uh, the technical material in those documents are baked enough that there are people out there that feel comfortable to, to actually do some, some board level product back planes and some systems. Uh, it is early days, there's, uh, you know, it's admitted. Um, there's, uh, if you go out and try to find product today, you're probably not gonna find a lot. Um, but I did wanna point out that people are using it and we're learning from, from all of that. So <clears throat> to wrap up, looking forward in uh, 2024 and beyond, uh, you know, there's a clear uh, interest in building these intelligent systems that are much smaller than, than uh, traditionally traditional 3U or 6U VPX. Um, while the standards are still in work, uh, they will finalize um, in 2024, um, both the, 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 the VITA 90 documents, uh, as well as the, the maturing uh, SOSA technical standard version 2.0. Um, 2.0 actually won't finalize, but there will be snapshots, additional snapshots in 2024. Uh, the drive for this is really the desire to shift uh, away from custom electronics and more towards COTS or modified COTS solutions, uh, even for these small uh, platforms, uh, and to leverage the power of, of SOSA and the power of, of modular open systems architectures. Um, really, the effort is to uh, make it easier to integrate systems, to make it easier to upgrade systems, um, and and to to you know really kind of be be uh, conformant and, and leverage the goodness of of these standards. Um, <clears throat> looking at uh, VNX Plus and SOSA in particular, uh, VNX Plus brings the same uh, uh, features and, and general capabilities as 3 VPX in a package that's less than a third of the size. Um, naturally, there's limitations. Physically, it's smaller, so you're not gonna put really huge components in there like large FPGAs or large GPUs. You're not gonna put a 200 watt GPU into one of these things. Um, but within the, the physical and, and thermal constraints, um, it's it's very much the same as as uh, Open VPX, uh, the same module types, payloads, switches, uh, clocks, PNT, power, and so on. There's the same architecture, the data plane, control plane, expansion plane, and so on. Same utility segment functionality, uh, plus some additional new things that we were able to introduce. Uh, the similar, I, I say similar, uh, uh, blind mate, uh, coax, and optical connections as as uh, VPX. They're not exactly the same uh, because of the, the constraints of the size, um, but, but very much the same uh, uh, concept. Uh, and the same scalability, ruggedness, modularity, and so on that you expect from, from OpenVPX. Um, you can expect product to hit the streets in 2024. You'll see the same kind of products that OpenVPX has, uh, development chassis and backplanes, SBCs, uh, GPUs, uh, PNT modules, receivers, FPGAs, uh, the, you know, the, basically the same portfolio of products you're going to see in, uh, from 3UVPX, you're going to see in VNX+. Plus. Again, sometimes, um, you know, less capabilities, maybe not quite so high performance, uh, but the same basic kind of functionality. Um, and lastly, you're going to see a lot of interesting innovations start to come out in 2024. Uh, people that are going to be approaching uh, cooling and things like that in innovative ways. Um, we think that that uh, Vita 90 actually uh, uh, opens the door to some really interesting um, uh, innovation avenues and that people are going to take advantage of it. Uh, maybe some more flexibility as far as packaging and, and thermals than you get with, say, OpenVPX. And with that, we're going to switch to Q&A. All right, Mark and John, thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, we've got a few questions already submitted, um, so we're going to jump right in. But if you would like to submit a question, please type it into the Ask a Question box and hit the Send button. 
Also, we'd appreciate it if you would take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. Okay, this question's got a little bit of a lead up and there's a couple of acronyms in there or abbreviations. So if I mess that up, question taker, please let me know and I will clarify. Um, question is, my problem with SOSA and hardware modularity is a recovery or is a recovery at runtime from an error. For instance, if a sensor at runtime has a data error that's uh, has a data error, it measures the software, should discover that to start some recovery operation for that sensor or to ignore data from that sensor if recovery doesn't work. What sensor-related firmware slash software do you have to support such cases? Some APIs? Do you work with some uh, software firmware providers? So I'll, I'll take that. Um, uh, I, I work in that subcommittee, uh, although less now than say uh, in a, you know six months ago or a year ago. Um, but that's one of the reasons why uh, I mentioned about the two channels of, of system management, the in-band and the out-of-band. The in-band is usually used more for you know the, the sensor application management, if you will, the launching and 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 uh, 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 the termination of of sensor components uh, in 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 SOSA modules. Um, <clears throat> But in addition, uh, the 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 uh, uh, the traditional, or I would say, the defined way of of running your application is in a runtime environment. So you actually have kind of complete control over it. And if your application goes south or the the runtime environment uh, is gets corrupted in some way, you have the ability to close it out uh, and and restart it without having to do a complete uh, uh, either board restart or a uh, system restart. Um, if the uh, board becomes unstable, uh, if there's some real hard problem that, that maybe requires that, that the, the board be power cycled, system management through Vita 46.11 allows for that. You have the ability to individually you know, power cycle, uh, either individually reset or individually power cycle uh, individual plug-in cards. And with the uh, VNX Plus, you have that same capability. Uh, so, so there's a lot of different ways of, of you know, managing the type of problem that you're asking. I would, I would encourage you to the, the, the author of that question to take a look at the SOSA technical standard and, and focus on the system management portions. And I think you'll find it kind of eye-opening. All right, thank you, Mark. Uh, how can people be making uh, VNX plus boards if the standard isn't done yet? John, you want to take John. that? I think so. I mean, and, and I think uh, you alluded to it there as we were kind of wrapping up a little bit is, uh, you know, there's there's enough of the foundation from 74 that people started dabbling with. And there's enough released now that, that people have the framework to, to begin with. And so it is still early on, um, but people have the, the hardware architecture, the outlines and, and enough of the, the mapping to to start developing cards and, and start building those. And as you as you mentioned, we should start seeing some smaller systems or some smaller uh, modules through, throughout this, this next year in 2024. Yep, just to, to build on that a little bit, the, the, I would estimate that the technical content of the Vita 90 documents is probably in the 90 plus percentile complete. Um, and uh, so few people feel comfortable enough to, to actually use that technical content to uh, to start uh, start making making product. Now, if if you know, is it going to be perfect? Probably not. Uh, but but you know, we're all learning, and we're all trying to you know get as much of a of a foothold in this new market as we, as we can. Thank you both. Is it possible to do anything useful? with such a small module and a low power limit? Again, I'll let John uh, start with that, but I'll tell you what, that's probably the number one question I get <laughs> asked about VNX Plus. Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, yeah, you are more limited than other form factors, um, but if we were to go back to the, the chart, we start about 25 watt system module on, on one of those smaller cards and 
uh, with some creativity and, and some some design work, uh, you can get up above the 50 to 60 watts per per module. Awesome. Speaking of modules, uh, how are the modules fixed into the cases or systems? For, go ahead, John. That was your slide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so through 90.4, um, mm -hmm. that, that talks about some of the retention and, and the focus is there. Um, it, it could be a, a wedge lock that gets that gets bolted in, kind of kind of locked in place. The majority of them are by the case themselves. Since it is conduction cooled, you want the surface to touch as much as possible on the sides and the, and the tops. Um, and so you're, you're kind of using the, the case as the retention and as the, the holding fixtures for, for these cards. Awesome. Okay. If I currently use VPX, what do I need to know to move to this form factor? Um, so I'll, I'll field that one, John, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. So the, the, I would say the first thing is that there is a lot of commonality. And I think we stressed that in the presentation. There's a lot of commonality between OpenVPX and, and VNX Plus with regards to the architecture. Uh, but probably the biggest challenge is that, that this is a different uh, size and shape of module. It is a slightly different approach than the Euro card in that you don't have fixed slot pitches, you have uh, 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 slot sizes, uh, module sizes, but not necessarily pitches. And so you actually have some flexibility with regards to building your system and your, your cooling strategy. It may be that you want to put some, some cooling structure in between the individual slots um, that, that's completely allowed in, uh, in, in, in VNX Plus. Um, so I would say that, that um, oh, oh, and then the other thing is, is that the, the UEIO port in the utility segment is something that's, that's unique here and uh, something that, that, that uh, could be quite valuable uh, for, for when you're, you're designing your system. So, so make use of it. John, did you have anything to add? No, I, I think it is just, as you mentioned, it's a different approach, right? I mean, you, you could design it the same way. You could have a similar architecture, but that's not what it was created for. It's, it's created to, to jump to that next level or that next threshold of size and weight. And so it, it's, a, it's a change. It's a change in thought and, and how you put it together. But, but as Mark mentioned, it's, you have a lot of flexibility with it as well. Yeah, and it's familiar ground. You'll find right away that it's pretty familiar ground. Hmm. All right. Um, a few thermal options were shown during today's presentation. Um, is one that was shown the main one for SOSA? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's not addressed in the SOSA technical standard yet. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and we're, we're being a little cagey in that we want to see what kind of, how things develop in the market. Um, in addition, the, the de definition of the wedge locks is probably about the last major technical component that's still in development in, in, uh, the VITA working groups. And so, uh, at the moment, the answer is no, there is not one. Um, but I would say the traditional way to do it is, as John described, to use the, 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 the enclosure uh, case itself to press up against the sidewalls of the, of the module. Um, you've got basically three surfaces uh, to, to attach to, uh, the two sides and then the, the front face, if you will, the non-connector face. And that as your heat, main heat path is, your, is going to be your primary approach to thermal management. Fantastic. Okay, um, that is going to conclude today's presentation. So on behalf of Military and Aerospace Electronics, I'd like to thank Mark and John for their excellent presentation. And of course, to all of you for joining. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.